What's up, guys? Doc Danny here with the Doc and Jock Podcast. And I want to take a couple seconds to talk to you about one of my favorite products that I've added into my life in the last year, and that's the Performa Sleep Mattress. Hands down, this is the best mattress I've ever slept on. I used to sleep on a steel spring mattress, and I thought it was great. I had it for about six or seven years, and uh, no way did I want to change until I made the the switch to the Performance Sleep Mattress, and I thought to myself, why didn't I do this years ago? Um, I wake up in the mornings, my back isn't stiff, I feel really rested, you know, I fall asleep really quickly, I sleep really cool, I'm not sweating in the night anymore, my wife sleeps like a rock, I can barely get my dog off the mattress, which I guess is a a hindrance in a way, but it also shows how much he likes it. Uh, So guys, if you're in the market for a mattress, which you should change your mattress out about every six or seven years, Take a look at this one. You know, it's definitely one of those things that you spend a third of your life on this, so you might as well get a good, solid mattress. And this one in particular, geared toward the athletic community. So guys, take a look at PerformaSleep.com. Listen to the podcast we did with John Maxwell if you want some more information. And uh, get your sleep optimized. What's up, guys? Doc Dan here with the Doc and Jock Podcast, and I'm by myself today because Coach Joe is stuck up at West Point, and I am in Asheville, North Carolina at the Clinical Athlete Summit, and I'm talking to Nick Shaw this morning, who's the founder and CEO of Renaissance Periodization. Um, so if you guys aren't familiar with it, it is a nutrition online performance consulting service. They have a bunch of uh, info products, and it's been a really, really cool uh, service that I've actually had personal friends and and, uh, actually colleagues that have used it and had some really good responses with it. So I want to get into what's the magic behind it this morning with Nick. So um, first of all, Nick, thanks so much for uh, for meeting with us. Yeah, thanks for having me on. It's uh, it's a pleasure. Well, cool, Nick. Well, so uh, here's what I want you to do. Give us an idea. What is RP and and, and why'd you start it? Yeah, so RP is uh, you know training and nutrition company. Everything we do is online, at least right now. And um, it started actually about four years ago, almost to the day. And uh, the idea kind of started when um, I actually lived in Manhattan uh, along with my you know co-founder, Dr. Mike Isertel. He has a PhD in sport physiology, um, not too far from here actually at, uh, at uh, East Tennessee State University which is kind of one of the only programs like that in the country um, to get a PhD. And, you know, basically all you think about, worry about is, you know, sport performance and things like that. So it's pretty cool. Actually, a lot of my colleagues went there. So uh, it's it's pretty neat. But, uh, yeah, anyways, you know, we both lived in New York City for a while and uh, we were personal trainers there uh, right out of college. And, uh, you know, we just like training. Um, We actually kind of come from like a bodybuilding, powerlifting background and, we just really like training and, you know, helping people, you know, get stronger, get leaner, you know, get more muscle, you know, whatever it was. And uh, at the time, you know, we noticed some of these bigger jack dudes at the gym that we were training at. And we thought, you know, you know, they're obviously, you know, really big guys, really strong guys, but uh, we just couldn't help but kind of notice and overhear some of their training and nutrition stuff. And we were like, man, you know, some of that doesn't seem quite on point. And we just thought like, you know, if you have these, you know, really talented individuals and, you know, maybe if you can combine the scientific approach, like, you know, that's really something. And so the idea behind RP is, uh, you know, we're, we're coming up on about, you know, 20 uh, staff members or so. You know, they're all, you know, coaches, consultants. And, uh, you know, we're coming up on probably about 15 of those all have PhDs in, in various, you know, biological sciences, you know, nutrition. So it's, it's pretty neat in terms of... Uh, you know, having kind of the best of the best in terms of the academic side. So, you know, the highest credentials, you know, you have a PhD in, you know, your field of study. Um, but the other cool thing is that, you know, we're all competitive athletes ourselves, you know. For example, we have two female uh, coaches, both with PhDs, one in nutrition, one in um, neuroscience. And uh, they're actually both uh, world champion jujitsu fighters. Wow. That's so, badass, man. Yeah, yeah, no, that's uh, that's really cool. I, I would never mess with either of them. They yeah. would they would both kick my butt. So, um, but yeah, that's kind of the idea of RP is is you know taking the the best of the academic side and uh, you know combined with people who actually you know kind of walk the walk and talk the talk. Yeah, that's uh, I, I that's really neat. I think it gives it much more um, credibility to what they're to what they're saying. You know, I, I had this. I kind of got in trouble for saying this on uh, Twitter one time about how I thought practitioners should be healthy, which it seems like a pretty like, 
I don't think that's ultra, um, you know, aggressive to say that. Okay. And I got a lot of backlash and people are like, what if they're old? I said, like, what if they are old? They can't, I mean, that's not an excuse. Uh, so I agree, man. If you, and that's a pretty badass PhD, uh, you know, to, to be able to uh, world champion jujitsu practitioner. That's pretty cool. Um, so this, this service and, and the nutrition stuff you guys are doing, who, who typically are, are you working with at this point? Like where you, what's your, your average, uh, customer look like? Oh, uh, yes. Good question. So, uh, I would say it's, you know, we, we, we work with a lot of people, you know, all different, uh, you know, kind of backgrounds uh, in various sports or, you know, ranging from, you know, CrossFit, powerlifting, weightlifting, you know, strongman, you know, some bodybuilder, you know, physique athletes. And, uh, you know, we get this a lot. And I think it's actually a really cool thing that people kind of think this, but they're like, oh, well, you know, do you guys only work with athletes? Well, no, actually, we work with just, you know, tons of everyday, you know, men and women just looking to, you know, get in better shape, you know, get leaner, get healthier, you know, you name it. And so that's actually our templates have kind of opened the window into a lot more kind of general population type stuff. Whereas, you know, we definitely started with a bit more of the, uh, you know, athletic crowd, but it's kind of, you know, spread like wildfire just to, you know, help more and more people out there and kind of everyday America just, you know, lose weight, be healthier. Well, you have a really interesting um, Instagram channel. I think it's, I think the transformation, uh, like before and after pictures, are pretty profound. There's some there's some people in there that, I mean, it's like night and day to see, to see the difference they make, and uh, I, that that probably gives you a lot of uh, social proof and credibility. Um, so so let's RP. All right, how is RP different from something like? Um, you know, metabolic flexibility or counting your macros and, uh, or something like the, uh, you know, kind of counting your blocks and, and things like that. Um, what, what's, what makes RP different? Um, you know, it kind of combines elements of, uh, you know, a few different types of things and it goes back to the, you know, nutritional priorities. You know, I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with it. You know, you can look up our YouTube channel and, you know, there's pretty cool nutritional priorities video on there by Dr. Mike Isertel. But, uh, you know, more or less, it just kind of states if, if you kind of know, you know, the building blocks of, you know, what's most important, what's, you know, not quite as important in terms of, you know, altering your uh, body composition, you know, performance. So uh, calories in, calories out are, you know, number one. Um, and then, you know, your macronutrient intake is number two. And, and those are really the big two. So if you can get those, you know, if you can nail those, uh, you're looking at probably about 80% or so of your diet success. And, you know, there's a couple other things in there like nutrient timing, uh, food quality, you know, supplements. But those are all kind of minor details in the grand scheme of things. And so, you know, it goes back to, you know, what makes RP different. Well, it's really, you know, the evidence-based approach to everything, you know, having the PhDs on staff. But then, you know, hopefully, I think one of Dr. Mike Isertel's, uh, you know, my, my colleague, co-founder, you know, his best strength. And I've sat in some of his classes that he's taught. Uh, he actually teaches at Temple University right now. Um, so does another one of my colleagues, Dr. James Hoffman, and they kind of run the, the exercise science, you know, part there, which is pretty cool. But, yeah. uh, you know, he just has a way of, of taking stuff that can seem, you know, overwhelming or confusing or, you know, stuff that might be complicated to some. And he can present it in a manner that's, you know, really easy to understand and, you know, take it and present it to people. And it's almost like, a, oh, yeah, well, duh, you know, that makes sense. And so I think that's just kind of, you know, hopefully what, what sets RP apart is, you know, just taking what can be complex information and breaking it down. So, you know, anyone, you could pick some random guy off the street and go, hey, you know, take a look at this, you know, does this make sense? And he'd go, oh, yeah, all right, you know, well, that makes sense, you know, duh. <laughs> Yeah, well, the YouTube channel is really good. So, you know, we'll link to that in the in the show notes, by the way. But um, on the YouTube channel, your colleague actually does a good job of explaining a lot of the back end stuff for RP. And and um, I do I think it makes a lot of sense. Plus, he's a huge person. Also, he's a giant looking human being. Um, so <laughs> he's, a, he's a powerlifter. Is that right? Uh, you know, he comes from a powerlifting background. Uh, you know, trying to get a little bit more into bodybuilding now. Uh, you know, it's funny you say that. And uh, you know, he's only about five six, but uh, yeah, you know, he's, he's about two hundred thirty pounds. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he's, he's about <laughs> as tall as he is wide. So. He is the the widest person I've ever met. Is Donnie Thompson yeah. uh, in Columbus, South Carolina. And it, uh, we had a picture of Joe and I standing next to him. And if you put Joe and I like Together. side by side, he's wider easily, yeah. easily. Um, so, well, let's talk calories in, calories out, because that that seems to be you know I look at the hierarchy of it. It made up uh, a good chunk of the priority of need. So why yeah, about why half. is that like number one, overwhelmingly number one? Yeah. So you know, I like you know in, in the RP diet book that we have, it's an ebook. Uh, the analogy is you know calories in, calories out are, are basically the engine 
of your car. So you can kind of focus on all the details. You can have your macronutrient, uh, you know, intake in line and, you know, have the best timing and best supplements. But, you know, if, let's say you're trying to lose weight and you're not actually, you know, lowering your calories throughout the diet to, you know, eat less, be in a hypocaloric state. It's kind of like having a really nice car, you know, like a it's actually, I have, have a picture in the presentation I'm going to do here in a bit at the clinical athlete thing. You know, it's like having a Lamborghini, but uh, no engine in it. So, you know, it may look great, but, you know, are you going anywhere? You know, the answer is no. So, you know, if you're trying to lose weight or, you know, even the inverse applies if you're trying to gain weight, but you're not, you know, let's say jacking up calories to be in a hypercaloric state to gain weight, um, you know, you're not going to be really going anywhere. Well, so... What about macronutrients? Because that was number two, and um, it was the ratio. So where where are these specific percentages come from? Um, is it is this from the research that your colleagues do, or is this like, I mean, how, how do you come to whatever percentage somebody's supposed to use, and is it based on their goals as well? Uh, yeah, you know, so the percentages and stuff are just kind of more or less a, a visual breakdown to just show like you know, what's really, really important. And so I think the, the big takeaway there is, you know, if you look at the nutritional priorities chart, you go, all right, well, you know, calories in, calories out is about half of the battle, you know, or it's like way up at the top, you just have this little sliver that's, you know, food quality. And so if you're trying to lose weight and you're, you know, not focusing in on how many calories you're eating or, you know, maybe you're not, you know, kind of monitoring, you know, your body weight to see if it's actually going down or going up. And, uh, you know, you're just really focused on, you know, eating the quote unquote, you know, cleanest foods or, you know, stuff like that. It's, you know, you're just, you're just kind of mi missing the bigger picture and you're not going to, you know, really get the best results that you could possibly get out there. So, right. you know, the actual percentages are, you know, you know they're not like super precise, uh, but it's more or less meant to be like a visual representation of, you know, hey, here's what really matters versus, you know, Here's something that, uh, you know, you don't have to spend a lot of time. And I think, you know, as you kind of, it, let's say if you were brand new to dieting, you wouldn't want to dive right in and, and start focusing on all these really small minor details because people can get, you know, overwhelmed if you throw too much information at them. Sure. So I think, you know, something like, uh, you know, Weight Watchers is really kind of popular in general across the U.S. And they were, you know, not too many athletes probably using Weight Watchers, hopefully – that's not I don't know any <laughs> yeah yeah but more or less it's just like you know hey here's like a point system uh you know don't go over this you know it doesn't really you know have I don't think too many restrictions on what you you know can eat in terms of actual foods but you know something like that's a really good starting point for people and then you know maybe above that you know something like you know tracking your macros if it fits your macros because you know again if, if you have those two in line you know that's probably the, the two biggest pieces of the puzzle right there and yeah, you're, you're going to be able to be really successful just from doing those. Yeah, I like that. I have some patients that we, you know, we'll see that are just unhealthy, and some of it just food-based nutrition uh, uh, or food education is what they need. So, you know, we'll have some people that will start on a really kind of simple, like whole thirty-ish approach that are not very active. But what happens is they end up eating just like their weight in bananas and almonds sometimes, and uh, that it negates the purpose of what we did with them. So the you know the the macro side of it, and then the the calories in, calories out, I think is a, a pretty interesting starting point for a lot of people. Now, when you when you look at these macros, uh, on the flip side of that, do you guys um, ever look at micronutrients and or like blood testing with athletes to see if they have something real specific going on that maybe is kind of holding them up? Uh, yeah, so a really good question. You know, I think in terms of blood testing, uh, I don't know a ton about that. And, you know, I know I've asked my colleagues, uh, you know, a little bit about that. And, uh, you know, maybe down the road, there'll, there'll be some kind of good evidence on that. And, you know, it might be the next great thing. You know, yeah. I'm not saying that, you know, will or won't, but kind of right now, it's it's too early to, to kind of really say. And so, you know, the good thing is, uh, you know, we're all humans and we all kind of tend to respond to the same stuff pretty well in yeah. general. You know, the same would be, you know, applied in, you know, let's say training, right? So, you know, you know, again, we all share a lot of the same genetics and stuff like that. So, you know, the same basic principles are going to more or less apply to, to most individuals. Now, the big exception being if people have, you know, certain medical conditions. But, you know, with what we do and being kind of sport, nutrition and performance based, uh, you know, unfortunately, we can't, e even though we have some of the highest credential people uh, in the industry, we have, um, you know, all the PhDs, we actually have a, a you know, a medical doctor on staff, Dr. Uh, Trevor Fentner, uh, went to school with us at U of M undergrad, actually. Um, he's in Chicago right now. And, uh, 
you know, Jen, Dr. Jen Case, which is one of the world champion jujitsu grapplers. Uh, you know, she has a PhD in, you know, human nutrition and also has a registered dietitian license. So we do have three, three RDs on staff. But again, you know, with things like medical conditions, we, we would, you know, gladly refer out to somebody in person. So that's kind of the exception to the rule. But, uh, you know, again, most, you know, the nutritional, nutritional priorities are, are you know, going to apply to everybody. Right. It's just kind of, you know, individual differences in, in terms of like genetics, right? Because I'm sure we all know somebody who can eat whatever the heck they want and they'll still lose weight. Yeah. Whereas, you know, we, I'm sure we probably all know people who it seems like, you know, they can you know, diet really hard and they just have a harder time losing weight. And so, you know, the, the priorities still apply, but it's like, you know, t- the degree to which, you know, it's basically, you know, just shifting the amounts around and stuff like that. Sure. Yeah. So this sounds like maybe, uh, if what you guys do, you get, kind of stuck and you don't see progression like you normally would, it may be a sign of, hey, all right, well, let's get one of your docs to take a look at some things uh, internally. That's something that I've seen a lot of really odd, um, simple uh, things that are missing, particular vitamin D is across the board. I think, I mean, I don't know, 80, 80 or 90% of people that I've tested are deficient in that, but that's probably because we're not outside naked in the sun all the time um, <laughs> like, we're, like we're supposed to be. But uh, so, you know, Going forward, and this kind of brings us to supplements because this is a small percentage of what you talk about. And, and I like that because I think that people – the amount of money I see people spend on supplements is crazy. Oh, yeah. I mean it's nuts. It's just like you, know, you want to buy this $80 bag of uh, you know, hydrolyzed, isolated, totally. whatever it might be that, that is grass-fed, which from my understanding, it doesn't matter what here's, here's the gut anyway. Um, so, so anyway, so the supplements is kind of small. But um, you do have a couple that I've seen were recommended in there, different kinds of proteins. It looked like casein in some cases at night, uh, whey or so like in the, during the day. So, so the supplements you guys do recommend, are there a couple that kind of carry over? Most people could probably get away with um, being successful using. Yeah, so I think it's really important, kind of like you talked about, you know, again, that goes back to if someone's focusing, you know, on these really small minor details and they're missing the bigger picture, you know, if like, you know, I'm sure, you know, we've all kind of heard the story of, you know, some, let's say, 16-year-old kid walking into GNC and he'll be like, hey, bro, it's like the best supplement out there, you know, how do I get jacked? You're like, okay, hey, you know, I have this, I have this one, this one simple, you know, magical trick, right? Like, that's the fitness industry, everyone wants that one magical pill, you know, trick, and it's like, hey, spend years eating a bunch of food that's how you get jacked well all of a sudden like that's not really appealing you know the 16 year old goes oh like well oh really like uh, uh, you know no, no, give me some supplements or something right. you know, what's that you know <laughs> magic thing i can take to get jacked and you're like all right well it doesn't really exist but you know you spend a couple of years just eating a ton of food and stuff like that so again i think it's important to state that you know supplements you know they, they won't make a huge difference in Again, it goes back to the nutritional priorities chart. You know, if you look at that, you go, all right, well, you know, could you replace that stuff with whole food and, and get really good results? You know, absolutely, you totally could. Yeah. You know, that being said, I think, you know, especially with your audience, you know, a lot of practitioners and stuff like that, you know, the convenience factor of supplements, I think, is huge. So if you're between clients or something, you only have a few minutes, you know, what's easier – you know, to, to consume, you know, let's say like a, a pre-made ready to drink shake or something like that, or, you know, sitting down and having chicken, broccoli and rice. Well, of course, you know, it's simpler to just have the shake. So I guess that's a long winded answer to get back to, you know, kind of the main five supplements that we think have a lot of evidence behind them and have, you know, been out there for a while and, you know, show that they actually do work. Uh, you know, the first three that I'm going to mention, I, I almost don't even consider supplements because, you know, they have a bunch of calories in them. So I think of them more or less as food. So whey protein, you know, really fast digesting is good for around training because uh, it gets into your system quicker. Uh, the opposite of that is casein protein, which is really slow digesting. So it might be good, you know, at night or let's say if you have business meetings, you know, for, you know, five, six hours during the day and you can't eat, you know, during that, you could have a casein shake before and you should be fine. Um, you know, the third one is like a, you know, a high GI carb around training. And again, this gets into more, you know, performance uh, nutrition. But, you know, those three, you know, you know, it's protein and carbs, basically. So right. I almost don't even think of those three as uh, you know supplements. They're just food. Um, and then the last two, you know, probably uh, creatine monohydrate and caffeine. And again, those those five tend to be you know the most kind of tried and true, and you know have a bunch of evidence behind them. You know, there's a whole bunch of other tier of supplements too that you know might be promising and stuff like that. But you know, right now it's it's kind of too early or you know too hard to kind of give a definitive answer on those. And those are those are boring, right? I mean, that's the, totally. those are the boring ones that 
<laughs> I, I think people probably were listening to this like, give me something good, man. Give me something crazy that I can start taking. I mean, I, and I've taken a lot of weird shit like in terms of like supplements, especially when I was in the Army. You go to GNC on base, and I remember, I remember taking that Jack supplement, whatever it was back in the day before they, before they banned it, and uh, thinking like, wow, man, I'm really like <laughs> – yeah. We're lit up at the gym right now, and then so oh, somebody died from that, and <laughs> and then they started testing for it. Actually, the military these these derivatives of certain things that they didn't want people to have. So, yeah, maybe it would just been better to take some caffeine and uh, and get a similar response. But but yeah, those are boring. I don't think people want to hear that, you know. And 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 for me, and this kind of brings me to like stacking carbs around training. You talk about like a like like a simple carb that you could use as a supplement or something like that. And, and something like a Vitargo, which is, you know, I started taking that around my training, not really expecting there to be much of a change, but bef- like before in intra session and then after with a little bit of protein and water made just as big of a difference for me in recovery as yeah. anything that I, I did externally um, and sleep included, you know? So, so why, why stack carbs around training? Like what's, what's the big benefit for that? Yeah, so I think for a lot of people who have kind of never done, you know, let's say some, and again, this can be something as simple as like Gatorade powder, which you know right. you can go get at Walmart for like you know five, ten bucks, and it'll last you know a long time. So again, you know, you don't have to spend money on these you know super expensive you know supplements. You know, obviously, I think most supplement companies are you know kind of coming out with something like that. Uh, you know, I, you know, pretty much every supplement company has some type of you know intra carb or you know post workout carb, something like that. But yeah, you know, it's really interesting to, you know, to, to see the feedback. And, and we have an RP clients on, group on, on Facebook that has a lot of, uh, you know, members. I think it has like something like 21,000 people in it now. And oh, wow. it, it's really cool to see like, you know, people talking about it for the first time. And, they, you know, they've never kind of done that before. And they start doing it for a few weeks or a month or so. And they're just like, you know, wow, like instead of kind of hitting that wall and training, you know, I have energy to push through. And this is probably, you know, more true for longer workouts, you know, I don't know, two, you know, three hours. And yeah. you know, if we have a lot of weightlifters out there listening, you know, they're like, oh, yeah, well, duh, you know, standard session is two to three hours. Yeah. And you, know, you kind of hit that, you know, second half of the session. And, uh, you know, it can, it can make a pretty big difference if you've never done it before. So getting back to, you know, why why it's important. Well, you know, I think just the energy component, uh, it, you know, it's probably number one. And then it actually kind of helps set the stage, you know, in terms of recovery for, you know, the next training session, you know, and things like that. So it's, you know, more of a performance thing above all else. And, you know, as you get into higher level, you know, athletics and, and nutrition, I think, uh, you know, again, nutrient timing is, let's say, 10% of the overall picture in terms of the priorities chart. But, uh, you know, when you start getting up there into higher level, in I think the good example to use here is two-time-a-day training. And that's actually going to be, uh, you know, uh, something that I talk about later. And there's a cool graph that I have from Dr. Isichal that kind of lays, you know, a sample two-time-a-day session out there. But, you know, if you're training hard a couple times a day, the importance of, you know, the, the fast, the high GI carbs getting in your system pretty much right after that first training session, well, you know, it's going to be the difference between, you know, kind of, you know, feeling like crap for that second session or, you know, having energy to get, you know, get through it and actually have a productive session. So it's basically, you know, you know, when you train, you know, your glycogen levels are going to deplete a little bit. Well, if you get those high GI carbs, you know, again, they get into your system really quick. And so it kind of helps, you know, refuel, you know, refuel your tank, so to speak, so you're ready to go later on. Well, it seems like it would fit really well with a weightlifter anyway, just because they have so much more downtime. And it's not, it's not like they're doing a 30 minute Metcon and then trying to like drink something in the middle when they're already about to puke, you know? Yeah. So, um, and the, and the, when, you know, when I got into like weightlifting blocks where I specifically just focused on that, I was really surprised at how long I was actually at the gym and how it just it wasn't like cardiovascularly fatigued. I was just like neurologically fried. Like yeah. I couldn't do anything fast, yep. you know? And, uh, as I started adding some of these things back in, it's, it, it did help quite a bit in particular how I felt the next morning. Um, now, what about let's talk uh, you know, about something like intermittent fasting. What, what do you guys? What, what is your stance on on that and and uh, versus kind of the the RP approach? Because I've I've seen you know I've seen quite a few people that have done really well with that. Um, particularly males. I don't mm-hmm. think women seem to do as well with it. Um, and they weren't they were more like endurance athletes. I would say I don't think they were like the strength athletes um, quite quite as well. But what, what are your thoughts on that? 
Yeah. So again, you know, it's really cool. We think back to the nutritional priorities chart and, you know, if you're nailing the, the calories and macros part yeah. and, you know, again, intermittent fasting was just, you know, maybe you're missing just a little small chunk of that, you know, 10% nutrient timing. But again, you know, there's different parts to nutrient timing and meal frequency is one of those parts. So again, it's like maybe you're, you know, missing, you know, 5% of the equation, which let's think about it in the long run. So let's say we do a three month diet and let's say if you're following everything perfectly, you know, maybe you lose, you know, 15 pounds in three months. Like that's pretty, that's pretty good. You know, yeah. it's, it's over a pound a week, which is, you know, you know, you know, there should be, you know, hopefully no one would be upset with, with losing 15 pounds in three months, but you know, 5% difference. Like what is that? You know, out of 15, that's what 0.75 pounds. Yeah. So it's the difference between, you know, losing 14.25 pounds and 15 pounds. Like, you know, is anyone going to notice in, in the long run like that? No, not really. You know, the only in terms of the meal frequency and nutrient timing part, you know, maybe it's just slightly better if you're kind of feeding throughout the day, you know, let's say every, I don't know, four to five hours while you're awake, uh, you know, just again to kind of keep the, you know, amino acids in your bloodstream because if you're not sort of eating them, you know, where does it come from? Well, it's probably going to come from your muscles a little bit now, you know. You know, that's one side of it. The other side is kind of the, the practical application of it. So let's say you're a bigger person. You have to eat, you know, three, 4,000 calories. Like, you know, how do you do that if you don't have, let's say, five meals throughout the day and you're only having, you know, let's say two or three yeah. in, in, in a small, you know, time span, you know, only later in the day? You know, and that's where it becomes from a practical standpoint harder to do where if you have more meals, you know, it's better. But is there kind of any like magical you have to eat, you know, five, six, seven meals a day? Not necessarily. Again, a lot of it's individual preference as well. So, you know, typically I think most people are probably used to eating three meals a day, you know, the standard breakfast, lunch, dinner. I mean, do you know anyone who doesn't, you know, snack throughout the day too? Like, you know, it, it's pretty easy, you know, to have like four or five meals throughout the day. And, and usually with RP, you know, like one of those is a shake and, and maybe even two if you have a casein shake at night. So, you know, it's not uh, it's not too overwhelming from like a time standpoint. So it sounds like these the, – it sounds like it's the principles, right? So the, these are the principles. This is what – this is what we view as the hierarchy of, of, uh, of needs for you to hit these these training goals or these uh, these um, uh, metabolic change goals, whatever you want to do. And um, but something like intermittent fasting or something like paleo, even it seems like you could just uh, overlay that on top of it. And I mean, mm -hmm. and for me, like I, I did intermittent fasting for quite a while when I was in the army because I'd wake up in the morning and I'd be running by six thirty. Yeah. I didn't want to eat anything. <laughs> yeah. I would maybe drink a cup of coffee. And then afterward, for some reason, I just I wouldn't be hungry at all. We'd do like a hard session, and I wouldn't be hungry. And then I'd get right into my sick call hours, and then I would I could barely take a piss until like you know lunchtime. So, so there's no way I was eating, and and uh, but then I'd be so hungry yeah. for these eight hours, I would yeah. eat like four meals in eight hours, you know. And but but if you applied this to that, I guess if you train in the afternoon. It seems like you could actually hit every percentage. You could tr you could stack around your um, your training. You could hit the calories in, calories out. It would just you'd have to eat a lot in a shorter period of time. Yeah, no, uh, you know, thank you for mentioning that. I was going to bring it up myself. Um, you know, what tends to happen if, if people don't eat for a really long time? Well, you know, you're going to be so hungry that yeah, you end up overeating at another time. Um, it was something that it kind of took me a while to figure out, and I just never could kind of pinpoint like what it was people were trying to get at. But you know, you, you hear people say all the time like, "Oh, you know, I, I'm, un you know, I just I underread all the time." Well, it's like, all right, well, is the scale going down or are you losing weight? Right. right. No, no, you know, I'm not losing weight. I mean, you know, I'm staying basically eucaloric state. Their their weight never changes, and they're more or less the same. You go well. And I always thought, I was like, well, how are you under eating? And it took me a while, but I, you know, I finally figured out, well, people just meant that they under eat at certain times of the day. And what happens if you under eat at certain times of the day? It's like you said in your story. Well, yeah, you know, let's say you get up in the morning, you train really hard. Well, no one wants to eat, you know, right after a really hard session most of the time. Well, again, you know, that's where like something like supplements and, and a shake is pretty easy to get down and getting those calories in, which is going to hopefully help lead to better recovery, a little bit more energy and stuff like that. But, you know, if you don't eat, well, you're going to overeat at other points of the day. So, you know, you hear people say all the time, well, let's say if they do train in the morning or, you know, whatever, and, and yeah, they will under eat at certain times. Well, they're making up those calories later on. Like, don't you worry, you know, they're yeah. not just, you know, chronically under eating and, you, right. know, you know, malnutrition, <laughs> you know, losing a bunch of weight and stuff like that. So, yeah. you know, I think it's important when people say that to kind of think, well, all right, well, you know, let's kind of monitor your body weight. And if you are under eating, like you'll start to see that downward trend and, 
you know, most of the time you, you do not see that. So, you know, what? I've had some success with having people just, um, start a private Instagram feed and just take a picture of everything that they eat and preparation to see what they should or shouldn't do based on like trends of what they're eating uh, during this. I think food journals can be a little hard and people don't really stick to this, but if they can take a quick picture of it, we can get a better idea of what they're eating. And, uh, yeah, it's when I hear somebody say like, oh, I don't really eat that much. Or I don't eat much of this or that. And they're honestly taking pictures of it. You can't hide from that, and and then and then we know, right? So, um, and, and what are your thoughts on? Um, I had a I had an instructor when I was in undergrad that his philosophy in a lot of ways was that people kind of have genetically an average, an, a kind of a set point, and mm-hmm. plus or minus a certain amount of pounds or or, or uh, you know whatever it might be above or below that. It requires not too much work to you know add X amount of percentage, but to go above that, it's a lot of work. I think that uh, totally has a lot of relevance and, uh, you know, I, you can see that a lot with, with clients, you know, so we have a lot of one-on-one clients and you know, I think it's kind of cool. I guess I've been doing this long enough that I probably worked with, I don't know, close to about a thousand people myself, like individually. Oh, wow. And, uh, you know, you definitely can see it, you know, people have, you know, this really hard time kind of getting over that hump, so to speak. And it's the, the body weight set point theory. And then, you know, it seems like kind of once if they can break through that, you know, again, it might be tough, um, but it seems like if they can break through that and it goes both ways if people are trying to gain weight too, you know, you've seen it, seen it a lot, you know, people have a really hard time, you know, gaining weight. Well, then all of a sudden they kind of break that little, you know, they break, you know, they break through that little barrier or, you know, get over that hump and then it becomes a little bit easier. Um, so I think there's definitely something to that. And, you know, I'm sure we've all heard someone or, you know, know someone out there who just, it seems like no matter what they do, you know, they just, they're fluctuating around the same weight all the time and, yeah, so I definitely think it has some merit to it. Yeah, I, I had a, a good buddy of mine uh, who's uh, on the Mobility Watch staff with me, Rob Wilson. He's built like a Viking. I mean, he's a huge human being. And uh, last time I was around him, he was uh, he was at our house after we had taught, and and uh, he was telling my wife that I could I could get to two fifty if I wanted to because Rob is Rob is probably two hundred forty pounds, or and uh, and I weigh one hundred seventy five pounds. I'm a skinny little bitch, and and he he goes, no, no, no you just got to do, you got to eat this and that, and and I go. Is that going to make my wrist bigger, Rob? Like, is your, you know, because your calves are giant and mine yeah. are really small. And so I, th- I definitely agree. I think there's, uh, I think you can, you know, gain weight and, uh, but, but to some degree, yeah, adding 75 pounds to somebody, um, it can be, that can be a really long time in the making. I say it's not, it, not possible. It's just, uh, it's, it's a hard, uh, hard task for sure. And, and, you know, to some degree, losing weight as well. I think, I think that, um, it just depends on how committed you are, right? And it seems like people that totally. are doing this are, they're on board with you. Like, c- compliance is probably not going to be an issue. Uh, well, hopefully not. You know, actually, this is a really good time to, to mention this. But you know, above all else, on the nutritional priorities chart, um, there's this kind of over overriding principle, um, and we used to not have it for a while. But you know, we we had to add it because it, it almost seemed like so obvious that it wasn't there at first. But it's this idea of consistency, and so. You know, touching on what you just said, like, could you get up to 250? Well, you could in time, right? If let's say you have, you know, five, six years. And I'll give the example of myself. I was a, I was a runner in, in high school. I was a cross country runner, and so I weighed. You don't look like a cross country runner at all. Yeah, by the yeah, way. yeah, for sure. I don't look like it now. <laughs> uh, and I, you know, I was okay. Uh, I think uh, let's see if I think about it, like 1745 uh, 5K um, was my That's best fast. time. Yeah, you know, it's not too bad. Um, and so I've, I've been as heavy, uh, it's about 260, 265 as well. So like when I was in high school, I was about, you know, 160 pounds or so when I was a runner and I was actually one of the bigger runners, you know, most of those kids are, you know, 130, 140, small, something yeah. like that. So, you know, again, it's, it's the consistency aspect. Well, yeah, if you have, you know, five or 10 years and, you know, I think I competed in my first ever bodybuilding show in like 2008 or something like that. You know, I weighed like 175 on stage. I think it was 174 to be exact. And, you know, now now I'm like 215. But, you know, and people always go, oh, yeah, well, you know, whatever. Oh, maybe it's like good genetics or something. Well, no, I, I, I'm i going to be honest. I don't have, you know, that great of genetics really at all. But, again, I was very consistent. And I worked my ass off for years, you know, going through, you know, specific mass phases, cut phases, you know, maintaining weight and all that. Well, you know, so, yeah, I'm 40 pounds heavier that was, you know, eight years ago. So right. what's that break down to, you know, five pounds a year. Yeah. But when you, when you think about it that way, it's like, oh, okay, well that doesn't seem that far fetched. But when you, when you just look at it like, oh, 175 to like 215, like, you know, that's huge. That's 40 pounds. Well, you know, break it down. If you can gain, you know, a couple pounds of muscle each year, which is really good. And I think a lot of people overlook that. They're like, yeah, bro, I want to gain like 15 pounds of muscle. Like how fast can I do it? And I'm like, oh, that's awesome, man. I'm like, yeah, I don't know. Do you have like, you know, two years? And they're like, oh, oh, really? Yeah, that's- Shitty answer for people, right? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> no, that's that's a 
that's that's huge, man. Well, I think you can apply it to pretty much anything in life, just consistency in general. But uh, yeah. um, it, it's it's also you know I have a friend, uh, Jared Moon. He, he calls these uh, qu- kind of uh, keystone habits where. You know, all right, if you if you dial in your nutrition, this could be the same thing with training. You know, something is going to bleed into the other thing, right? So um, if, if you're spending all this time on your nutrition, you're going to want to train hard, right? You're going to want to do these things to actually be successful. So um, and, and that kind of brings you to like, one of the last things I want to talk to you about, which is really men versus women. You know, I, I saw you have specific kind of women-based um, uh, templates or an ebook specific, uh, specifically for women. And then for, for men, and I'm that's just a general one. Um, so what <coughs> – should they, should they eat differently? And if so, like, where does it differ? Um, really good question. So we have a female dieting book. And uh, <clears throat> the, the first third of the book is more or less, uh, you know, a summary of, like, the RP diet book. And the RP diet book has been read by tons of men and women. And it's sort of it can be applied very easily for both. Uh, the main difference is in the female dieting book, and I think the, the middle section, there's, a, there's basically a whole third of the book dedicated to, to, to dieting psychology. And I think right. that's really, really big. And this is probably, you know, way more so important for females. You know, you just hear it time and time again from females where it seems like, you know, they've been trying to diet their entire adult life. And, you know, that's, man, that's tough. You know, that's, and again, now now we know that, you know, dieting is not a lifestyle, you know, because by definition, it, it, it is restrictive and, and you're, you know, re- restricting or lowering calories. And so we like to kind of approach it from the mindset where, Think about it in terms like if you have like let's say two or three months where you can be pretty you know, dang dedicated, that's what you want. What you want to try to avoid is getting into this slippery slope where you're you know pushing it really hard during the week. And again, this goes back to the consistency aspect. Let's say you're dieting you know hard five five days out of the week, so Monday through Friday is pretty easy when you're on that set kind of work schedule. But then the weekends hit and you just kind of do whatever you want. And again, so you're building up that diet fatigue Monday through Friday. And, you know, no one, you know, kind of really likes dieting, right? Like, let's be right. honest. Uh, I don't know. Maybe some people do. I don't know. But, you know, so you're building up that diet fatigue Monday through Friday. And then let's say, you know, you're losing a little bit of weight during the week. And then the weekend's hit and you kind of, you know, you'll have a couple cheat meals or whatever. And then, you know, come Monday, you're right back to the same weight. It's frustrating, right? Right. right. So you think, well, damn it, you know, I just spent, you know man, I just spent this whole last week dieting. Yes, you, you know, you technically did, but then, you know, Saturday, Sunday, you know, you're kind of reversing what you did earlier in the week. So then, you know, at the end of week one, you're net even. And then the process repeats itself and repeats itself and repeats itself. And where are you a month later? Well, then you're not down very much weight. And it's, you know, I think that is the slippery slope that people get into with this, you know, feeling like they're dieting all the time. And I think that's really something that sometimes, you know, especially females just, you know, they just need kind of like a diet reset where they're not, you know, worried about food intake or, you know, doing any of that. And that's all covered in the female dieting book. So I think that part is really important. And then uh, the last third of the female dieting book is like female specific issues, you know, you know, dealing with like, you know, your, your hormonal cycle and, uh, you know, if people are, you know, pregnant or if they're nursing afterwards. And so it's, you know, it's female specific issues. But, you know, going back to, you know, how does dieting differ uh, well, you know, the priorities, again, they're not going to change, you know, for, for females. It's just <clears throat> dealing with sometimes the psychology aspect in terms of trying to plan things longer term. And again, um, my wife actually has a, a pretty cool kind of blog post on our website, but it's like, you know, why massing is beneficial to females. And again, this goes back to the psychology aspect where a lot of females are just, you know, terrified of the thought of actually gaining a few pounds, and well, if, like if your goal is performance and to get better in the long term, and I'll give the example, you know, we work with a lot of CrossFit athletes and, uh, you know, I had this girl, she took like top 50 in her region, but she weighs like 125 and I just broke it down to her. I'm like, yeah. you know, your limiting factor is your strength because you're competing against girls who are about as lean as you but weigh like 150. Now, right. obviously maybe they're taller and stuff too, but it's like they have a lot more muscle than you. And so I convinced her, I'm like, here's what you need to do, you know, uh, so she didn't. She, she did not quite make it to regionals, but she did very well in the open. You know, which ends in what I think March, something like right, that. Right, yeah, that does. So I'm like, you know, late spring. I was like, here's what you need to do. I'm like, you're in the off season. The off season is the time to make body composition changes. You know, you gotta you gotta mass. And so she did. So now she's up to like 135, and she still has abs. 
you know, because again, you kind of mass up for a while and then you want to hold that weight for a little bit, going back to the set point theory we talked about a little bit. And now she's cutting back down and she'll probably end like the low 130. So again, that's like probably six, seven pounds heavier than she was last season. And guess what? She's like, yeah, you know, I'm hitting PRs on everything. And, yeah. you know, and, and she's like, you know, all my gymnastic stuff is starting to really come back. And as she loses those last couple pounds to get her back down in the low 130s, you know, her gymnastics are going to be better than ever because she's going to have more muscle and she's going to be just as lean as she was at 125. So, you know, again, it kind of all ties back into the psychology aspect. And, and, and I don't know, I always kind of like to think of dieting and dieting as like a long term thing, whereas there's so many people only interested in the short term and the quick fix and all that. But again, that's what leads to these, you know, fads and, and gimmicks and these, you know, quick fixes, you know, detoxes or, you know, 10 day challenge where you can lose 10 pounds. Well, it's great. You can lose right. 10 pounds. Like anyone can lose 10 pounds or whatever in a couple of days, but it's going to come right back. So if you, if you kind of sit back, you, you know, calm, cool, collected and, and rationally think about it and plan in the long term, I think you can be a lot more successful than, you know, just chasing the, these, you know, very short-sighted uh, goals that you know may get you from point A to point B really fast. Well, almost anyone can do that, right? And if you think about it in terms of like a trainer, well, any trainer can throw you some really hard workout that's gonna just you know crush you. Like, where does that get you? You know, in the long run, can you keep doing that repeatedly? Well, you know, probably not, right? You're gonna get really beat up or hurt or something like that. So, you know, I think I think it's just important to kind of think about things from the long-term perspective as well in terms of dieting. You're, you're dead on. In fact, you answered. Uh, I mean, I wrote a question down about my wife, um, and she listens to all these <laughs> later, right? So she, this is going to be like a month after this comes out. Ashley, you'll hear this. So, so, but, but for her, like, she's always like, "Man, I want to get stronger." Like, she gets a little bit stronger, and she, and uh, you know, they've been doing like she she predominantly does CrossFit, but they do a lot of strength um, cycles as yeah. part of their as part of their training. But uh, she doesn't want to get bigger, right? So, and the, and the paradigm is, well, I want to get stronger, but I don't want to get bigger. You know, is, is that even possible? And if so, like, you know, how, how much progression can she expect to even make? Uh, I think you nailed it with that last part. You know, how much can she expect to make? Well, again, you know, it's all trade-offs, right? So if she does not want to gain weight, if she doesn't want to actually mass, we just have to be realistic in, in what your expectations are. You know, can you get stronger, say, in the same way? Yeah, well, sure, right? Like, I mean, people do it all the time. You know, there's right. a huge kind of, you know, neurological component to training. And so you can definitely train that and get stronger, you know, at the at the same weight. But, you know, it's maybe just not quite as efficient. Like, you could get you could get stronger by, you know, actually gaining weight and, you know, gaining muscle because what happens, you know, it's no coincidence that, you know, the best power lifters, weight lifters in the world, like, I mean, the Olympics are going on right now. So if you look at some of the top weight lifters, well, it's no coincidence that they're very jacked and they have, you know, about the most muscle that they can given their weight class. Right. So, you know, if you're able to gain weight and gain some muscle, well, you, you know, most surely should be stronger. So, you know, again, I think it's just trade-offs and, you know, again, you know, it's tough, man. Um, you know, I've been able to convince my wife to mass before and, you know, I think it's paid off. But, uh, you know, man, it's, it's it can be a real big mental hurdle to kind of overcome. Oh, yeah. Just even saying that out loud, like just I, maybe when you change the term, like massing for a female, I don't think sounds appealing. And yeah. Uh, yeah. and even though, you know, it's not like they're going to get fat by any means, but but just bigger. Um, yeah, there's a huge stigma with that. And they have, they have a way harder time than we do, you know, like totally like even look like the, there's a, there's the dad bod, wherever the hell that is thing. And that's actually not unappealing. I think to females, they're like, Oh yeah, dad bod. Like it's fine. You know, there's a little beer belly. Um, but there's, that's not a thing for women, right? So that's, uh, that's a, <laughs> there was a double standard. It's, it's, it's hard for them. Um, so looking at how, you know, the RP can, you know, maybe help people that are actually listening here. Is, is, is when I look at your your website, there's seems like there's the ebook, there's templates, and then there's coaching, and those seem to be the kind of like three tiers of how much support you actually need. So, um, tell me a little bit about all those things. So, if if people are looking to try to kind of dial in their nutrition, they have a better idea of what they should pick. Yeah, you're actually right. Those are the three tiers. So, you know, the ebooks, you know. They're anywhere from, you know, 24 to like $40. So they're, you know, not super expensive. And like, if you just want general information and, you know, you're a kind of do it yourself and you want to take that information and you can, you know, build your own diet and, you know, training programs. Cause we have a few different eBooks, you know, one is the RP diet book. Um, we have one that's uh, principles of strength training, uh, written by, uh, you know, again, two PhDs, Dr. Mike Israel, Dr. James Hoffman and, uh, co-authored by Chad Wesley Smith, you know, one of the best power lifters of all yeah. time. Mm -hmm. Uh, so again, like it gives you the tools and the understanding and the basic knowledge to, you know, 
be able to build all of your own programs if you're into that. You know, a lot of people, they like learning that. But, uh, you know, some people, it's just easier. They want something that's laid out in front of them and like, hey, just, you know, tell me what, what I need to do and, you know, I can follow it. And that's, you know, what they're after. And so the step above that are the templates. And, you know, a template's roughly, you know, about $100. And we have diet and training ones too. And, you know, what it does is, is it lays everything out for you. But again, it, it gives you the basic layout and you're able to kind of, and this is the training templates example, you know, you have like a drop down menu of different exercises, you know, that are going to focus on specific things. And you're able to kind of fine tune and, you know, work on what's specific to you, the individual. And then um, they have a cool auto regulation feature built in where you can rate the workouts and it'll help adjust your volume. So right. if it's just crushing you, you know, you would rate it accordingly and the volume's going to drop a little bit <clears throat> later on in the mesocycle. Um, in, in going off of that, we have the diet templates, which are, you know, by far our number one product. Like they've reached, you know, literally tens of thousands of people worldwide. So it's really cool to see. But it's taking the knowledge from the book and laying it out. You know, and, and basically, like, you don't have to do any thinking. Like, you just look at it and you go, all right, like, you know, here's what I need to do. Here's what I need to follow. And so, again, those are roughly, you know, around $100 for templates. And then, uh, you know, above that, we have our one-on-one -on -one coaching, which, you know, everything's customized based around the individual, their, you know, their questionnaire. And so everything's, you know, very specific. You can get to work with, like, a PhD-level coach, which is pretty unheard of in the fitness industry. You know, and that's a little bit more expensive. But, again, that's that, you know, one-on-one -on -one customized, uh, you know, uh, experience. Well, so and, and what's the um, what's the website where uh, social media channels also if people want to find out more about um, what you guys do, where can they go? So uh, www.renaissanceperiodization.com. Uh, you mentioned earlier Instagram. So that's probably our most popular channel is our Instagram account, and that's uh, at RP Strength. Uh, and we actually have another really cool one. I just started a few months ago. It's uh, it's at RP underscore Transformations, and uh, we're coming up on about. 300 so we're over 350 transformation pictures on there and uh, you know real soon we'll be at uh, 365 which i think is really really cool because let's say you were one of those people that kind of needs uh you know a lot of motivation on a day-to-day -day basis you could literally look at the instagram account every single day yeah. and there would be a different transformation mm. picture and story on there so i think that's pretty cool and you know Again, we have the RP clients group online, and again, there's literally at least one or two before and after pictures in there. So again, I just have to keep like pulling them from there. And so, you know, before too long, I hope to have you know 500 or 1,000 before and after pictures, which I think will be really sweet. Yeah, that's cool. Those are definitely the I think the most interesting thing of about the social media channels, and, and I think it's easy for people to be proud of that. You know what I mean? Like, I, I there's probably a lot of people that don't want to take a picture of themselves in their bathing suit yeah. and put it on the internet for everybody to see. Totally. But you know what? If you go from being um, whatever really small and get bigger or big and then get smaller uh your your confidence level is just so much better and you're you're totally, totally willing to to do that and and uh that's huge social proof you for you guys that's really neat um so but you know what nick this was great man i really appreciate you sitting down and talking with us um we'll make sure guys all this stuff is linked up in the show notes if you want to learn more head over to their website um grab one of these ebooks or templates or, or coaching if that's really you know the route you're going because uh, it, it, you know, if, if you have training goals and you're not tracking your nutrition, you're going to have a real hard time uh, achieving that. So, uh, Nick, thanks again. Thanks so much. And uh, we'll have to have you back on sometime. This was fun. Yeah, cool. Uh, I appreciate it, man. And uh, looking forward to the talk here in a little bit at uh, the Clinical Athlete uh, Summit. Absolutely. Me too. All right. Take care, guys. Thank you so much, gang, for tuning into today's episode of the Doc and Jock podcast. We hope you're enjoying the topic of the day or the interview. If you are, please head on over to iTunes and review it and let us know so we can either talk about that topic again or bring that guest back on. Also, guys, while you're at it, post a question and then Dr. Danny and I can tackle that question on our Friday short. The topic could be mobility, weightlifting, motivation, anything in between. Dr. Danny and I will tackle that. It's a great service to us, a great service to you. You get some knowledge, we get a bump in the standings, and we really appreciate that. Also, guys, we'd appreciate your support on all the social media outlets. Check out at Doc and Jock on Instagram and at Doc and Jock on the Twitter feed. And also, guys, like, share the Facebook page and visit www.docandjock.com. You'll notice, guys, we're in the middle of a rebrand. We've changed the badge. We've changed the logo. We are overhauling the website, and we'd love to know your thoughts on that. Thank you, guys, for tuning into the Doc and Jock podcast. And remember... If you have a body, you are an athlete.